We're back. This is episode 33, right, Joe? Yeah, it's 33. Yeah, 33. Mm -hmm. We keep count. We know how to count here at Arenda. (laughs) In the last episode, we introduced combined chlorine. We called it combined chlorine 101. Well, now we're going to do combined chlorine 201. This is how to get rid of it. So if you got combined chlorine in your water, you got chloramines, you got issues with disinfection byproducts, this episode is for you. I'm Eric Knight with Arenda, and with me as usual now, I think you've surpassed Jared, Joe. We got Joe Swayze, our our VP of sales, and he has a chemistry degree, so I lean on him a lot. Joe, you've been on, I think, almost as many episodes, if not more episodes, than Jared has been. Oh, I'm feeling lucky. It's pretty good. Lucky, (laughs) man. I'm feeling lucky. Jared's the worst co-host ever. He just abandoned us, you know? I'm just kidding. Jared, please don't, please don't punish me for saying that out loud. No, I'm just kidding. Um, uh, I'm glad to have you here. We are going to cover a very important topic. This is very important for commercial pools, especially residential pools. If you have it, this can, you know, combined chlorine can be a part of a problem that might lead to other issues uh, because it consumes a lot of your chlorine and, you know, you plug in the pieces of what that could lead to. But, uh, Without further ado, episode 33, Combined Chlorine 201. Let's go. Welcome to Rule Your Pool, the podcast by Arenda that explains and simplifies pool chemistry so that anybody, regardless of experience, can understand it. I'm your host, Eric Knight, bringing clarity to these subjects so that you can bring clarity to your water. If you're ready to rule your pool, then let's go. All right. As a quick refresher, Joe, uh, combined chlorine is just evidence that you have nitrogen compounds in your water and chlorine has to combine with things that contain nitrogen in order to oxidize them. Is that a good summary? That's a good summary. Okay. So the way you measure combined chlorine is you measure your total chlorine, right? You take your total chlorine and you subtract your free chlorine. And the difference between them is combined chlorine. Do I have that right? You also have that right. Okay. Excellent. So in this episode, let's talk about how do we get rid of it? Okay, so we have it. Chlorine starts to oxidize it, starts combining to it. Do we just let chlorine do its thing? Yeah, I mean, you certainly can. That's one way to go about it. May not be the most efficient way to do it, depending on how much is there. Um, but that's certainly one way to do it. But there are others too. So, mm-hmm. you know, you you certainly have some secondary systems that can help eliminate um, or prevent those things from forming in the first place. But um, so there's there's a few different ways to go about it. I think we should break this down into two categories. Let's talk about how we can chemically get rid of them and then how we can physically get rid of them. Which one would you like to uh, discuss first? Well, let's go that chemical route first. That sounds fun. Oh, fun. Yes. (laughs) Chemistry. Chemistry is fun. You know, I've never, pun intended here, I've never heard of a subject that has everything to do with water, but yet is so dry. Water chemistry is... We're trying to make it fun, people. We're doing our best. Okay, chemistry. <laughs> On that note, let's just dive right in, Eric. Yeah. Oh man. <laughs> wow. I'm not. It's too early for puns, man. But normally, I'm, I make the the worst ones. Okay. So chemically, there's really just um, two things you can do. If, if if there's a third, I'm forgetting it, and I apologize for that in advance. But uh, you can accelerate the process. So you could just keep going with normal chlorine, but if you normally chlorinate, you're going to fall behind because you're going to get a bigger and bigger and bigger proportion, assuming you have a similar nitrogen source. So like if you have a swim team that's peeing in the pool all the time, you know, they're coming in every afternoon at four in the afternoon or whatever it is. And they're in there at five in the morning. Well, there's nothing you can do about that swim team. Yes. You can ask them to shower before they get in, but they won't. You can ask them to not pee in the pool, but they won't. So that's a pretty consistent source of nitrogen uh, or urea in that case. But if you just keep chlorinating normally, your combined chlorine is just going to climb and climb and climb. Okay. It's kind of like mowing your lawn with scissors. Yeah. You'll get the job done, but by the time you're done, the front of your yard is growing back, right? You're never going to get ahead of it. That's a terrible analogy. I told you in the last episode, we were going to try to make analogies. I like it. Okay. (laughs) Thank you. I'm glad you did. The audience is just shaking their heads because this is just a terrible analogy. But the, the point is, you have to try to get ahead of it. And this is where the process of breakpoint chlorination is introduced. It's a buzzword in our industry. And breakpoint chlorination 
it resembles a roller coaster curve. And if you've taken Arenda Academy, which you can do for free online on our website, uh, we go through an entire video explaining breakpoint chlorination. And I don't know, I'll give you a, a chance to summarize this because we don't have notes for this episode, Joe. This one, we're just we're completely off the cuff. And I mean that honestly, we, we are off the cuff on this one. We had notes for the last episode, but um, we feel confident that we can explain this. Describe breakpoint chlorination the way you see it. Yeah, I mean, because it's a topic we talk about all the time, but breakpoint chlorination, pretty simply put, you've got to get to the point where all of the chlorine that you have in your swimming pool is free chlorine. Or, you know, or you've eliminated all of the combined chlorine that's in the swimming pool. Sometimes you get to the point where you have no chlorine in that scenario, but you've eliminated all of that combined chlorine. That's your break point where you can establish a free chlorine level without building more of that combined chlorine in the process. Right. And sometimes you can't get all of it out. I mean, just the fact of the matter is there are some chloro organic compounds that you can just oxidize to a point where they're still in there and you can't oxidize them any further. And they're, they're, they're just persistently in your water. And even breakpoint chlorination is not going to get them out. Now, breakpoint chlorination will absolutely get out the inorganic trichloramine, dichloramine, and monochloramine, no problem. It, it, it can absolutely get rid of that stuff. But all these complex hundreds of different disinfection byproducts uh, where chlorine has combined with some form of a nitrogen compound and maybe it didn't quite get all the way through and it started oxidizing through it, then it ran out of steam and who knows what you have left. Uh, even if you start oxidizing thoroughly through superchlorination, which is basically what breakpoint chlorination requires, there is some stuff that you just can't get rid of without draining your pool. And the, the good news is it's fairly inert. It's not necessarily that harmful and hopefully it's not that much, but Chemically speaking, the way you accomplish breakpoint chlorination is you put in a lot more chlorine. Now, the conventional wisdom in the industry is 10 times your combined chlorine level. So if you have half of a part per million of combined chlorine, which is, uh, as I learned yesterday from a phone call from Minnesota, that's the state requirement there. That's the maximum you can have. It's 0 0.2 here in North Carolina. It's 0 0.5 in Minnesota. I don't know what it is in your states, but... Um, it's less than one part per million, pretty much. So you're going to take 10 times that. So if it's half a part per million, you got to multiply that by 10 and you get five parts per million of free chlorine. Here's the problem with that. According to Richard Falk, the chemist that we rely on for a whole lot of stuff, he's like, that is not accurate. It does not require 10. It, there's some very specific mathematical ratio of what you need. It's not quite 10, but you're you're going to do it if you round up to 10. We'll put it that way. You don't need quite 10, but if you're going to do it, go ahead. You know, it, it'll it should accomplish it. The point is you need to super chlorinate to get ahead of it. So again, chlorine has to combine with this stuff. That's part of the process. And then it has to destroy that stuff. And once you've destroyed it to a point that it can no longer be destroyed, you reach the break point. And it looks like a roller coaster curve. You can see it on our website. We'll actually probably add this to the YouTube video of this episode. Um, but when you pass the break point, basically what happens after that is you can build a free chlorine residual. And the combined chlorine stays where it is because it can't be oxidized further. So your total chlorine goes up and your free chlorine goes up. But pretty much the difference between the two does not go up anymore. Is that a... Did I just confuse the entire thing? Maybe I did. <laughs> no, Look I think you got it. It'll make sense. I, I go in my left ear and, and out my right ear and tell you me. You want to get wrong. to the point, you want to get to the point where your free chlorine and your total chlorine are equal. Yes. And yeah, that yeah, that's no, better. Why didn't you 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 should have described it? <laughs> <laughs> you should have described it. That's a much better. Yes, you have to go through this process where you have to super chlorinate, you have to overcome this oxidant demand, this nitrogen oxidant demand. Did I say nitrogen oxygen? Nitrogen oxidant demand. You have to destroy it, and then you can build a free chlorine residual. Now, it's not like this happens linearly. It's not like, all right, at 8 a.m. tomorrow, we're going to do breakpoint chlorination. No, this is constantly happening, whether you superchlorinate or not, but usually it fails because you don't have enough chlorine if, it's, if you have a constant nitrogen source. So you may just continue combining, 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 and you know, destroying some, but not nearly enough, and you're trending in the wrong direction. You have to bring that roller coaster back down to the break point, meaning you got to destroy that stuff, get it down, and then you can start rebuilding a free chlorine residual. Look at the chart. It'll make more sense. 
That is the main way to chemically get rid of combined chlorine. But as we know at Arenda and what we teach on this podcast and on our website is simply throwing chlorine at a problem is not always the best way to do it. Right, Joe? Oh, in fact, a lot of times it's not the best way to do it. It's not. But when we're dealing with nitrogen, unfortunately, chemically, there's really only one way to get rid of it. And that is with enough chlorine. But with these chloroorganic compounds, the word organic signifies there is also carbon involved. And while the nitrogen itself cannot be touched, except by chlorine, there's a whole bunch of other stuff in these compounds that enzymes can touch. And if you simplify these compounds down, i.e. using enzymes, and again, it's our podcast, we make enzymes, we're not hiding our bias here. So this is not a product pitch, it's just to make you aware of it. You can simplify a lot of these chloroorganic compounds by getting the carbon aspects out of them, which means you need a lot less chlorine total because it's focused, you have more chlorine available to focus on the nitrogen and completely oxidize it. That's the key here. Joe, if you're if you're just combining with nitrogen and then you run out of chlorine, you're going to have a higher chlorine demand because you didn't get rid of the job in the first place and you got to come back to it later. And this is where the real irritants begin. What we want is we want to simplify chlorine's job. We want to take the bulk of its oxidants out of the equation with enzyme so that chlorine can really focus on and completely oxidize the rest of it with the nitrogen. Is that a fair statement? Yeah. And you're just simplifying the compounds that it has to take care of. So, you know, you're trying to avoid some of those really complex molecules then as well. And I want to be clear, enzymes will not reduce your combined chlorine directly. They will not. When you add them, you're not going to see a reduction in your combined chlorine from the enzymes. What you will see is a reduction in the amount of chlorine it takes to reduce your combined chlorine. So it's, it's an indirect relationship. We're simplifying the oxygen demand, but you still need the same amount of chlorine on the nitrogen, but now you don't need the same amount of chlorine on everything else. So in order to accomplish this, your combined chlorine will go down from chlorine without it focusing on all this other crud that enzymes can actually handle. So it's a supplement. That's really what it is. It's supplementing your chlorine for stuff so it can focus on what it needs to do. We talk about this in pillar two, which I believe is episode 22, and several other times that the whole point of using something like enzymes is to get stuff out of the way that chlorine was not made to get rid of so that it can focus on its primary job in water, which by the way, is not getting rid of nitrogen compounds. It's killing things. Chlorine is in our water to kill germs, viruses, parasites, bacteria, um, algae. It's, it's in there to kill everything. Nitrogen compounds are oxidants. So that's the next best thing that chlorine should be used for. It should not be used for getting rid of stuff that we can more efficiently get rid of easily with something like an enzyme, which brings us to our second half of this episode. Those are the only two chemical ways that we know of right now that can really make it an impact, which is you know chlorine and then supplementing chlorine. How about it? Um, well, actually, no, there's not. There's one more. What am I thinking? There is a non-chlorine shock. What, what is that? Uh, Peroxy peroxy monopersulfate. Say that again, slowly. Potassium peroxy monopersulfate. Aha, non-chlorine shock. Now, from uh, this is where it gets confusing for us. So full disclaimer, there are conflicting sources online about this. and We do not know. We do not manufacture this product. We don't know exactly. But uh, the sources tend to indicate this can destroy some of the nitrogen compounds before they are combined with chlorine. But once they're combined with chlorine, like if you have a mono or dichloramine or something like that, it can't destroy those. Is that your understanding of it, Joe? Because another source says it'll destroy all of it, and I don't think that's true. I'm, you know what? On this one, I'm going to say I'm not really sure uh, because I'm not. I, I, I believe uh, that I believe that it, it's one of those things where it depends who you listen to right now, and I'm not sure that there's any really substantive data out there that says one way or the other. Yeah, well, we know that you shouldn't be leaning on it as your primary way to reduce combined chlorine. Let's just say that absolutely, because absolutely number one, right. Right. it's monopersulfate, which means it is adding sulfates to your pool, which we just covered in a previous episode. I think it was 30 or 31. Uh, you don't want sulfates I in think, your pool. I think technically there is another a sodium persulfate that's another kind of that non-chlorine shock, not used nearly as often. But anyways, I digress. Yeah, yeah, so do I. We don't know. We're we're not gonna pretend we know, but look into it if you want to do the research. But you can you can help against the oxidant demand, and even if it just gets rid of the stuff that the the enzymes get rid of, hey, great.
great. It's, you're still supplementing chlorine, you know? Just don't lean on it as a primary thing that you're doing all the time because there are some byproducts that'll cause other consequences. All right, so that's the chemical ways. Now, physically, let's talk secondary systems. There are two categories of secondary systems. You know, we, we just divide things. It's like a pyramid scheme of our education. <laughs> uh, we, all, we like to divide into two sections and then divide within. Um, secondary systems, you have secondary oxidizers and then you have secondary, secondary disinfection. Now, some of them will do both, okay? Uh, one such thing, the main oxidizer is ozone. Secondary oxidizer, that is the primary. When you say secondary oxidizers, the number one thing is going to be ozone. The number two thing is going to be advanced oxidation process called AOP. Now, they work a little bit differently, but they're essentially injecting a gas at a, at a molecular level that is a very powerful oxidizer, like way more powerful than chlorine ever was. The only challenge with these is how they're delivered. They are a point of contact system, meaning you don't just like inject them into your pool and let them do their thing forever. They don't last very long. They, they actually last, I mean, I'm going to pick a number. It may not be exactly right, but usually through like six to 10 feet of pipe. And seconds. then they go into a, yeah, seconds. They don't last very long at all. And the water has to be circulating through that pipe to be treated. Now it might be constantly introducing ozone or hydroxyl radicals. And let me tell you, it destroys whatever it touches but it's at the mercy of the circulation system. It's only destroying in that area. And then you have like a contact chamber and then you have a degas chamber as part of that. So you have to be able to get all the excess gas out so it doesn't go into the pool. It's effectively in your pump room only or at your equipment set only. So if you have people in there and dogs and stuff peeing and introducing nitrogen, well, guess what? If it hasn't gone through the circulation system yet, chlorine is on the front lines starting to oxidize that stuff. So you are still going to have some combined chlorine. Now, the nice thing about these secondary oxidizers is once whatever you have, whether it's combined to chlorine or not, even if it's just a precursor that doesn't have chlorine on it, ozone and AOP should destroy it easily once it goes through the chamber. And it doesn't matter. Yeah, like I said, it doesn't matter if it's already combined or not. It, it'll destroy chloramines. It'll destroy nitrogen compounds. It'll destroy urea. It'll destroy ammonia if it gets through the chamber. That's the key. It's a point of contact system. So the issue is mostly timing. Now, granted, these things are awesome for reducing combined chlorine. I mean, absolutely amazing at it. So you have the higher your turnover rate, the better it's going to work. But uh, on big commercial pools, especially outdoor pools, ozone systems and AOP systems tend to thrive. Is that your experience too? Yeah, it is. And and it also, you know, like we talked with the enzymes, it can be a, a great reducer for the amount of chlorine that you have to use because it's, again, taking away some of that job that the chlorine would have to do. Mm -hmm. Now, the other main one, and there's actually, th there's another type of oxidizer called uh, hyperdissolved oxygen. It's worth mentioning here. It's HDO. It is not a sanitizer or a disinfectant, uh, but it accelerates chlorine's ability to oxidize because it's injecting purified oxygen in very high concentrations into the entire pool. So it's not a point of contact system. It's just purified oxygen throughout the entire system, which boosts chlorine speed. It boosts enzyme speed and efficiency. So I guess you could consider that a secondary system, even though it itself does not destroy combined chlorine, it boosts chlorine's ability to. So that's something worth mentioning. Uh, we'll call it an honorable mention. How about that? <laughs> I like it. Now, on the other side of mechanical, you have UV, ultraviolet. There's medium pressure and low pressure. You see how I'm pyramiding out, Joe? I, I got another category. Oh, it's always, always simple. I know. Like one, I know, two, yeah. three. Yeah. yeah, it always is. Um, UV, ultraviolet, has one advantage over AOP and ozone and HDO. Actually, not HDO, but the, the, the uh, oxidizers. 100% of your water flow goes through the UV chamber. The oxidizer systems are on a bypass loop. They don't touch all the water at one time. So they're feeding into the main line, but that doesn't mean it's oxidizing everything in that main line. They're on a bypass loop. Whereas if you have any formed chloramines, so anything that has the chlorine already attached to a nitrogen compound and it goes through a UV system, provided that UC, UV system is working correctly, it's going to destroy them. Now, there's a difference between medium and low pressure. It has to do with the light wavelength. 
the low pressure UVs, um, it's really not, I'm going to say the word weaker. That's not what I mean. It's just a different wavelength. Okay. A low pressure UV can destroy monochloramines pretty well. A medium pressure UV is what you really see on the commercial pools. They're a lot more expensive. They consume a lot more energy, but they kill a lot more stuff. So they are a sanitizer. They're not an oxidizer. They can't do anything to urea. They can't do anything to ammonia directly. But once chlorine combines to it, or you got a chloroorganic compound, it can break it apart. Okay, that, that's what it does. It disrupts. It breaks bonds, chemical bonds, disrupts RNA. That's how it kills germs. UV is awesome for this. So if you have uh, monochloramine in your tap water, for instance, you could put a UV system on after that infill line. So say you, after your, you usually want to do it like one of the last things in the room. So after the filter, after the, I guess the chlorinator would be after the UV, but um, if the fill line is before the UV and you're introducing chloramines from your tap water, 100% of that water is eventually going to go through that UV and get to, that those chloramines will get destroyed. That's a really, really important thing to know. If you have a commercial pool, you want to make sure your fill line is before the UV system if you have UV. The disadvantage is here, again, it's not an oxidizer. It can't get rid of the precursors to combine chlorine. But it, once it's combined, medium pressure UV will destroy monochloramine, dichloramine, and trichloramine easily. Unless trichloramine has already off-gassed. And in indoor swimming pools, I, I was with Paddock Evacuator for a few years, and almost every one of our customers who had a big problem with indoor air quality, they had had UV or ozone for years. So these systems are not infallible. They help a lot on the waterborne chloramines and disinfection byproducts. But once these things go airborne, it's no longer a chemistry conversation. It's now a air physics conversation and it's a dehumidification problem. And I want to make that very clear. Once it crosses the chasm into the air, there's nothing these systems can do. So I guess, man, I was about to go down a tangent and I just realized I was, <laughs> I was looking, I was looking real downhill. Like I was about to ski downhill real fast. And I realized, you know what? I need to pump the brakes here. Let's not go down that. That's another episode entirely, I think, where we talk about indoor air quality. Uh, Joe, is there anything you'd like to add? Oh, you know, I mean, I think one last thing that's probably worth mentioning is that, you know, when you when you have these systems, though, there are disadvantages to some of them. Like we talk about in several of the episodes where we talk about these secondary systems, none of them are kind of foolproof. None of them are, you know, without other considerations that you have to make. So listen to those other episodes, make sure you understand what you're getting into with those OV, UV, ozone systems, et cetera. Um, I like that hybrid, yeah. that OV. O yeah, that's, OV? That's kind of yeah. Cool. yeah. OV. That's our, that's, that's you our know system. What, yeah. We're going to, we're going to working on that let's, now. <laughs> let's just combine them all. Let's just go AOV. AOV. <laughs> that's that's secondary systems. Okay. That's funny. Yeah, look look at it. Everything has its weakness. If it's a point of contact system like UV, ozone, AOP, point of contact means you're at the mercy of the circulation. So you're not going to be able to get everything in the pool until it comes through the chamber. And that's the key. So just do the research. Find out what's right for you. If you really struggle with this because you do have a swim team, I mean, if you've got a swim team in your pool, you absolutely should have a secondary system on there. Unless it's an outdoor pool, you may not need that on an outdoor pool. Okay, it's nice to have an ozone or AOP system on an outdoor pool. It doesn't really make that much sense for a UV on an outdoor pool because you have direct sunlight and plenty of air to off gas. But um, and and sunscreen, <laughs> sunscreen blocks UV, and that's going to be in that water. Whereas an indoor pool, UV is awesome. It is absolutely awesome. So um, find out what works best for you. And for the residential listeners on here, we hope you you did gain some knowledge of, of what this is. And, and hopefully you don't have much combined chlorine in your water. And if you do, you can do the breakpoint chlorination thing. You could try the enzymes to supplement breakpoint chlorination. You probably don't need a secondary system in most cases, but um, at the at the end of the day, we're proactive pool care here at Arenda. Find the source of nitrogen. Find it and address it. You do that, you're going to have a lot less problems. Joe, anything else as we wrap up? You probably already know this because if you've listened this far, you know it. We love to talk about this stuff. So call us. We'll talk yeah. more with you specifically about your situation. Um, we love it. So give us a call. Yeah. 
Call Joe. I hate people. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Yeah, no, we, we take calls all the time. We really do. And we, it, it, as I said in the last episode, it warms our heart that people actually listen to this because we've never promoted, we've never advertised this through. podcast. And they listen to the whole thing. It's crazy. And we can see some of the metrics. We don't know who you are, but we can see how many people are sharing it and we can see how many people are listening to it. It's just, it's just awesome that uh, people think what we're doing is valuable. And it, it is, it is research. Like we actually, though we spitball in this episode, we actually do our homework um, in, in all of these topics. And we want to bring you factual information that's practical. And we hope that in these last two episodes, we were able to distill some pretty advanced chemistry to make it sound simple. It is not. Just, we, we told you what you need to know and you don't need to understand everything else. But if you really want to nerd out, we hyperlink to these things in our articles on our blog. And uh, feel free to go down the rabbit hole as deep as you want to go. We don't know what we're covering in episode 30, what, 34 is next? 34. As I said at the beginning, we were very good at counting. Uh, we don't know what we're going to cover next. And if you have something you would like us to cover on this podcast, reach out. Go to orendatech.com. That's orenda, T-E-C-H.com. Contact us. You can do it through the app, the Orenda app. You can do it on Facebook. You can email info at orendatech.com. Whatever you want. If you Please think there's a topic. The video. Yeah, yeah comment on this video. Let us know. We see all this stuff, and we want to know what you're facing out there that you want us to explain. Now, if we don't know it, we're going to do some research. Or we're going to tell you, yeah, you're... SOL. Sorry. But <laughs> at least we'll be honest. We're not going to pretend we know something we don't. And that's one thing that I think in any industry, education within an industry suffers when people try to say more than they should. And we don't want to be that company. We want to be as authentic as possible. And yeah, I know we're not experts on everything, but we know enough to be dangerous. So anyways, this has been episode 33 right? <laughs> I should have it written down in front of me. Thank you so much for listening. I'm Eric Knight with Arenda, and this has been Joe Swayze. Joe, you're the man. Thank you for getting up early and doing this. Thank you so See much. Y'all. Thank you for listening to Rule Your Pool, a podcast by Arenda Technologies. For more information on what we discussed in this week's episode, check the links in the description or visit www.orendatech.com. I hope you find this show valuable enough that you tap that subscribe button and share it with your friends. You can also like us on Facebook and social media. And with our help, you'll be able to rule your pool without over-treating it with chemicals and wasting money. I'll see you next episode.